Uh, during the 1980s, I became interested in computer networking. I was introduced to networking, computer networking in 1977, uh, where a friend of mine ran a symposium in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, where people like Vince Cerf and Louis Pouzin and all the people involved in the early days of packet switching and datagrams and circuit switching came to talk about computer networking, and I was fascinated. Uh, then I joined University College Dublin as the director of, of IT infrastructure, computing services as we called it back then, and started to do some networking work. And I proposed the Irish National Research and Education Network, HEANet, Higher Education Authority Network. And I brought BitNet to, uh, to Europe as the European Academic Research Network. Well, actually IBM brought it to Europe, but I was the first president of, uh, of uh, EARN. And then I was invited to go to the National Science Foundation and I joined them on the 1st of January 1985 as the first program director for networking. So my role was to build the supercomputer access network. Well, when I arrived, I changed all that. <laughs> I decided that instead of building a specific network for supercomputer access, I'd take a more strategic long-term view, at least that's how I'd express it nowadays. I probably didn't think of it in those terms. But rather than take a tactical view and connect supercomputer users to supercomputers, I argued that we really should be building a network, a general purpose network for all research, for researchers at the campus network, at their workstation on the campus, across to supercomputer users. And that in the long term, a general purpose network of networks would serve the US research community best, including supercomputer users. So that's how I got involved, and I designed and started to build the NSFNet, uh, which was a network of networks, or an internet. I determined that it would be, would use the TCP IP protocols. I, at the time, I became known as Mr. TCP IP, and I insisted that they be used. Now, that the clash between the strategic view and the tactical view was where the, all the arguments were. So people, were, people who were supercomputer users had no interest in the long-term strategic view. They wanted access to their su supercomputer now. Their model of the world was, give me a lease line to my computer, to my desktop, or my local VAX or whatever. Uh, they didn't want to rely on the campuses. But my model was different. And so there was a tension all the time between the short-term demands of the supercomputer access program, the advanced scientific com computing program, and the strategic view of building what essentially became the internet. So that's how I got involved, and that's my modest, I hope, claim to fame. One of the, for me, one of the key bro breakthrough moments was in 1984, when I was invited to come to Washington to uh, meet a group that were looking at, at networking for the US. Uh, I was also invited to come and talk to the National Science Foundation. And um, in fact, I was also invited to come and talk to the CSNet people about the, the role as director of CSNet. So I had a lot of opportunities and eventually took the NSFNet uh, program director one. But I, I took the red eye shuttle from, from San Francisco to Washington. So I arrived, you know, not in, the, in great shape. And I went to this meeting of, you know, the, 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 the giants of networking in the United States. This is one of my first early visits to the United States. And, you know, you have the impression coming from a small country that the experts in a larger economy, the experts in the US are giants, they're much more sophisticated and much more knowledgeable than, 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 than we are. And my breakthrough moment was sitting in that meeting and realizing that, you know, I was just as good as these people. And in fact, taking the marker and going to the whiteboard and sketching what I thought the network should be. And that realization that, that you know, I too could, could, could play on the same pitch as these guys was a breakthrough moment, through moment for me, personal breakthrough moment for me. In terms of building networking, um, 
I think one of the breakthrough moments was meeting a guy called Ira Fuchs, who was the founder of Bitnet, one of the, one of the two founders of Bitnet. Uh, now, Bitnet wasn't the internet. It was a, a technology was quite strange, um, but very effective. And Ira taught me the importance of delivering networking services to the end users, that really it wasn't about the technology. It wasn't about the protocols. It was really about empowering the users to do something useful at their research desk. And that's one of the things I brought to the NSFNet program, the idea that we must deliver valuable service to the end users. So those are a couple of breakthrough moments for me. I think for most people, uh, the internet, in weather terms, is in brilliant sunshine. It's warm, it's comfortable, it's exciting. But over the horizon, there are some very dark clouds. And those dark clouds are all about trust, about privacy, about data protection, about uh, data exploitation, monetizing of data, uh, about security and privacy. The issues that I think are going to become critically important to the internet. There have been extraordinary things happen over the last decade, 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 excuse me, decade or so, um, arising, I think, from the, the dot-com boom and persisting and becoming even more egregious now. The idea that personal data is there to be monetized. To the extent, not only personal data that is volunteered to you, but personal data that is stolen. There are now apps on mobile phones that steal personal data for monetization purposes. So the culture in, in, in this commercial arena has gone from bad to truly appalling. I, I don't understand how people think that my personal data, given for one purpose, is there for people to monetize for any other purpose. And I think that's a serious threat to the internet. I think that uh, Snowden has done the world a great service by exposing another serious threat to the internet, and that is the fact that those custodians which should be responsible for protecting our privacy and our interests are, are actually deliberately and with malice, hoovering up data in the anticipation that with data analytics and big data and uh, so on, that they'll be able to protect us better in the future. And this is complete nonsense. Uh, has completely undermined not only the trust in the internet for some people, but the trust in governments, governments for lots of people. And I think those are serious, dark clouds uh, on the horizon for the internet. So for most people, the internet is in brilliant sunshine. And it'll get better with faster technologies, better handsets, 4G, 5G mobile networking, uh, better apps, and so on. But those dark clouds are very, very serious, I think. And they are undermining the trust in the technology and undermining the trust in governments. And I think that's an issue. Well, I've outlined my concerns for the internet. Uh, you use the weather analogy, and I think it's sunny with very dark clouds. My hopes are that we will actually collectively, and in particular the civil society, will drive this will demand that the various actors address these concerns. Uh, my hope is that, that uh, civil society and governments will address the, the data privacy, data security, um, the, the criminal activities appropriately. And in that regard, much to my surprise, two things have happened that give me great hope. One I've mentioned already, which is that the European Parliament has passed the Net Neutrality uh, uh, Acts. Now, yeah, it's now up to the governments to, um, of, of Europe to ratify it. The, the structure in Europe is that way around. So I expect a huge battle with the telecoms people, a huge lobbying, because 
to protect their interests. Uh, and civil society needs to make sure that governments hear civil society's arguments here. The second thing that gives me hope is that the National Telecommunications and Information Authority or Agency, NTIA, in, in the Department of Commerce, and, um, has recently announced that they want to essentially withdraw the US government's um, stewardship of the uh, technical parameters of, of the internet. Uh, they announced that about three weeks ago, about a week before the ICANN meeting in Singapore, 10 days ago. And that gives me great hope that there is leadership in some governments to recognize the role of civil society, to, to recognize the role of the multi-stakeholder community comprised of the technical community, the telecommunications community, civil society, the participants uh, in the standards process, and governments as a multi-stakeholder um, grouping to provide the oversight and governance that's necessary of the appropriate parts of the internet. And that gives me hope. As, as I, since I've just spoken about trust, I think there needs to be a re-examination of what, um, what trust is required um, to improve the way people perceive technology and use technology. Uh, in that context, surprisingly, one of the exciting things that's happened is that the European Parliament, only the other day, has passed legislation on net, net neutrality. Very good legislation, which actually very carefully specifies what net neutrality is and very carefully specifies what exceptional services are. Now, the European Parliament is not known necessarily for its high-tech uh, foresight, but in this case, they're, they're leading the world in, uh, in passing legislation, which I think is really important, both in enforcing the idea of net neutrality and in allowing exceptional circumstances for special services. That needs to be followed by appropriate data retention, data protection legislation, and needs to be followed by putting manners on the security forces so that they actually act in the long-term interests of, of society. The security forces have been arrogant, extraordinarily arrogant. There's a deep suspicion that they have conspired to undermine security in the standards of the internet because they felt that they were smarter and better than anybody else. Not only their um, political antagonists around the world, but the criminals around the, around the globe. And that's fundamentally stupid. The security forces in states have to abide by the law. Mind you, the way some of them have acted, you wonder whether they ever consider that seriously. But within general, have to, the criminal fraternity never have to operate within the law. So to imagine that you can undermine security technology to give you an advantage is to be unbelievably stupid. And that's another threat to the internet, that by having created a global infrastructure that is not rooted in the national territories and government law, one has created a global criminal underworld that is very much in control of what goes on in the criminal world and is deeply threatening to the... I think one of the things that protects the economy from being completely undermined by the criminal underworld is that they have no long-term interest in completely undermining because they want to be able to take their fair share, as they would see it, of the, wealth, the global wealth, but take it criminally. That combination of data retention, privacy, data monetization, undermining security and criminal activity are the dark clouds that I talk about in the internet as we look forward. 
to deal with it, we need to put some shape on what's been called internet governance. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm a, I don't like the term internet governance. I think sticking two nouns together doesn't make a sentence and there's no semantic in it. So I think a more layered, more structured, more sophisticated approach is going to have to be taken to internet governance. And I think you've got to separate the underlying technology from the things that the IETF and the IAB and ICANN do in terms of the global infrastructure and what governments must do nationally and internationally. In all that, I think that civil society, you and me, or you and I, I suppose more correctly, need to make sure that we keep all the actors honest, especially governments. 